Silver is now back above the 200 day moving average again. It popped above it. And then today, obviously, it, it leaped over the 200 day moving average. So, I mean, if it holds at this at this level, even if it goes sideways for a while, we're going higher. Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Mark is here with you for Arcadia Economics as we continue on our coverage of the gold and silver world, which has no shortage of exciting events. We've seen the <laughs> December deliveries start this week. Also, a bunch of interesting news stories that have come out in the precious metals space. So quite excited to be joined by my friend Dave Kranzler of Investment Research Dynamics again. And Dave, great to have you back on the show. How's everything going with you today, sir? Things are going okay. Thanks for having me back on. This just so everyone knows, this was in lieu of my solo operation bi-weekly. So um thought it'd be nice to change it up a little bit. But uh I always love doing the interviews with you. Well, it's always fun to have you on here. And we're recording Wednesday afternoon where been quite a, an interesting morning for both gold and silver, uh, about 2.30 Eastern time. We see silver up about 75 cents here. So a lot happening. And Dave, perhaps the first place to start. Any thoughts on the rally that we've seen today, let alone over the last few weeks, where uh, both gold and silver getting well off their lows from the year? And curious uh, what, how you've been viewing these. Yeah, that's a good that's. A good way to start off. Uh, you know, I, I look at the charts all the time, although I'm not, you know, I'm not a pure chartist. I, I use them as, you know, it's just another tool that we can use to try and get an edge. And a couple of weeks ago, I, I was looking at GDX. I'm like, you know, there's a triple bottom here. And it's starting to lift off from that. And, and it's starting to look bullish. And then this past weekend, I was running through a bunch of charts, mostly you know, silver and silver stocks. And I was like, holy crap, we, we may have liftoff in silver. And, you know, silver is now back above the 200 day moving average again. It popped above it. And then today, obviously, it, it leaped over the 200 day moving average. So, I mean, if it holds at this at this level, even if it goes sideways for a while, we're going higher. <laughs> and another interesting thing that I've noticed my whole thesis this year, because, you know, to just to, to explain why I think gold is in the, and silver aren't performing well or hadn't been performing well, is that the hedge funds were, were shorting gold and silver futures along with uh, S&P 500 futures as the market was heading lower, right? And, um, and so, you know, there was a tight correlation you know, especially starting in April, because remember, if you think back to the mid mid to late spring, it was like felt like the sky was falling in the sector. Well, the sky was falling in the paper version of the sector and the sky was falling in the stock market. But the chart itself shows that the there was there was not really much of a correlation. There's a little bit of a correlation, but not much between uh, the directional movement of the S&P 500 and and gold and silver. I think I used gold just for simplistic purposes. But so then you had this tight correlation between the precious metals or the paper of precious metals and the stock market. And it, it kind of feels like that correlation is starting to separate. And yesterday's a good example because in the morning, everything was green, the metals and the stock market. And then the stock market headed south, maybe maybe in anticipation or fear over what Powell might say today. But the precious metal debt sector still maintain their bid. So I remember at one point I seeing the Dow down over 200. And then I looked at the, the Huey index, the MX Gold Bugs index, and it had been up as high as, I don't know, five or six points. And it was still up over four points, even though the Dow had sold off over 200 points at one point yesterday. So and the, and it hasn't been yesterday's not an isolated case. It's been that way over the last few weeks where you've had maybe even longer in the last few weeks where you've had days when not every day, but days when the stock market's gone down. But we've had a bid in the precious metal sector. So, um, you know, to me, along with 
just the way the charts look, we may be set up for a for a sustained move here finally. Yeah, and in terms of the correlation, as we're recording again on Wednesday, we see the stock markets are all up. NASDAQ up about 3% as the Wall Street interpretation of Powell's speech today, signaling smaller rate hikes <laughs> ahead. And we know that does put some juice into the market. So certainly seeing that in gold and silver today. And uh, do you have a forecast whether you're expecting 50 or 75 in a couple of weeks, Dave? I mean, Powell basically telegraphed to the world they're going to do 50 in December. So, and they've been, you know, some of the the less hawkish, <laughs> although none of them are hawkish, because I don't even think this monetary policy can be termed hawkish. But it's some of the some of the more uh, MMT leaning FOMC members, I should say have have hinted over the last few weeks that you know 50 would be appropriate in December. So I think that's that's probably what we're going to get. I think that's why the market responded like it is today. Um but I'll tell you what's interesting. This is going to be short lived. And the reason I say that is because the Nasdaq is up over 3%. So that tells you that the BTFD FOMO YOLO retail idiots and hedge fund algos are chasing this move. And as they're going into the most speculative stocks. The Dow actually is, is starting to fade now. It was up well over 1%. But again, you know, the NASDAQ's outperforming the Dow and the S&P by a factor of two to three times. Um, so again, that just tells you how speculative the, 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 the spirits are in the stock market still. And we're not going to have a stock market bottom until that's completely squashed. Yeah, well, that does make a lot of sense. And uh, interesting, as we look at uh, one other note <laughs> here on some of the Fed funds futures that are being priced in, you can see uh, market expecting, I guess they're not taking James Bullard full, fully seriously. I know he was talking about as high as 7%. But if we look out here, seems like the probability suggests five to five and a quarter. And this seems to have changed a bit over the last couple of days where a rate cut in July of next year, and then perhaps another one by December. So will be quite an interesting year to, to see how that all unfolds. In fact, something I, I remember I mentioned at one of the Silverfest panels, it was going, uh, somehow I came across one of our emails from the fall of 2021. And we were talking back then about the Fed and that, you know, you had a better chance of seeing elephants flying then the Fed finally raising interest rates from their 0% policy for the past decade. And just interesting to think how quickly things shifted this year with getting the 75 basis point hikes. And I have a feeling next year will be quite eventful. Perhaps we'll see more impact of the hikes that we have had here already. Although taking a step back and looking more at the longer term picture, this is perhaps uh, what I, I imagine both you and I feel is driving gold and silver in the long term. We had this story last uh, last week, uh, right around Thanksgiving. Ghana will buy, uh, is ordering their miners to sell 20% of the refined bullion to the government. Here's the interesting part. As the government on, embarks on a plan to barter bullion for fuel, Obviously, we've heard about de-dollarizing. Saudi Arabia wants to join the BRICS. Uh, Russia, with everything it did earlier this year with the ruble and gold. Um, curious your thoughts here, especially that we're seeing government announce a plan. Would you say this is fair to say using gold as money? Well, gold is money. <laughs> well, that may well be. But now that we're again seeing countries using it as money, perhaps, which will be the real driver going forward as they continue to step away from using dollars for similar purposes. Well, yeah, I, I mean, to me, what, you know, you can see what they're doing there in the, in the two bylines to the headline article, right? They're, 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 they're trying to prop up their currency with, with gold. So, and that's smart. Um, I think I think the idea is, is 
is uh, you know to try and reduce the the amount of their currency. I guess is it SETI? Is that how you pronounce it? Whatever. Reduce the amount of their currency, you know, circulating via trade around the globe. So, um, you know, because it's like if, if they if they have to keep printing more of their currency to to buy oil, it's going to continue devaluing the currency. Well, this way, they're basically exchanging the currency for physical gold and using that to pay for oil. And then they're not going to have a problem finding any OPEC country willing to do that. I mean. Um, I think there's there's several countries now that are I, I know at least I think India might be um, exchanging gold for oil. Um, pretty sure they are. Um, so yeah, and I you know I wouldn't be surprised to if we start seeing more central banks doing that. And along those lines, we're certainly seeing plenty of central banks out there, primarily in the Eastern Hemisphere accumulating a lot of gold right it's not just russia and china accumulating the gold it's a lot of different central banks a lot of countries are yeah which leads into my next question because okay we've seen these things unfolding in slow motion gold and silver both up quite a bit since in the over the last 20 years yet in terms of what I think has driven uh, a lot of people's interest over the longer term, seeing that there's problems with the current system that as you and I were talking about before we hit the record button, it seems on an unsustainable path. I'm curious, how do you see this not next year, but whether it's five, 10 or 20 years out, do you imagine that there's some sort of return to a gold backing, that there's some sort of reset, whether by the governments, whether by the markets, but how do you actually see gold being used? Could it be something like if people have purchases that say someone wants to buy a car or a house or just wants money to buy groceries that they're trading in at perhaps using a some of the bullion dealers almost like an ATM where it's like all right here's my gold and silver and then whatever you're using to transact or perhaps we have something like kinesis or but how do you actually see this unfolding in the long term and and working out That's a good question um I mean being on a on a metallic standard or a gold standard or gold and silver you know because that's really what you're talking about a gold and silver standard doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to be paying for goods and services with actual metal right i mean the the idea behind creating a currency tied to gold or tied to gold and silver is to give the gold and silver fungibility right so if if you know if your country's central bank holds enough gold to back the currency that they issue they can issue they can issue you know you can being able to issue currency against gold gives a hundred ounce bar to visibility right or 400 ounce lbma standard bar it gives it divisibility and that's really what the intent of the currency so if you're on a true gold standard you're going to have the currency that your central bank issues is going to be backed 100 percent by gold and silver. I think they're probably going to have to use silver in there also. But, um, you know, then you also have the issue of accountability for that. I mean, I don't know how many people really believe that the U.S. still has 8,100 tons of gold. I think anyone who spent time researching it and thinking about it is wondering if the U.S. has any gold, actually, and I'm not sure that it does. I mean, yeah, there's gold sitting in the Fed's vaults, right? But a lot of that gold, most if not all of it, belongs to other people. <laughs> Even if it formerly was U.S. owned gold, <laughs> it's been it's been leased out or it's been you know allocated out, you know, to back paper claims and you know via derivatives. So the way that I would envision it, and I don't. You know, I'm assuming it's probably going to be some type of digital currency. Hopefully it won't be the the currency won't be used in a way that's malicious to the population, although I probably will be. But I mean, I think that's how it's going to work is the central banks accumulate gold and probably silver and they issue um, digital currency 
against that. You know, I don't know if it'll be 100% backing, but um, so you'll you'll have a, a a currency system that's backed by a metallic standard. And I don't I don't know if the West will agree to that, but it certainly looks like the Eastern Hemisphere. You know, as Andy explained on the Silverfest podcast that we had, that roundtable. I mean, if people haven't seen that, go watch. You know, he went on a on a on a rant, for lack of a better way, you know, term to to describe it, about you know what's going on out there, and it's right in front of us if you just know where to look for the information about the the monetary system reset that's being set up. That's now that has been joined by most of the OPEC countries, if not all of them, right? And so that's if you go listen to what he lays out, I think that's where we're headed. Which is again, it's it's going to be a gold a gold or a metallic backed currency system, and the way that I've always envisioned the accountability working, right? Because the U.S. say, "Hey, everyone else is doing it. Yeah, we want in on that. Guess what? We have eighty one hundred tons. You know, let's just revalue the price a bit to back the currency that we've we've <laughs> flooded into the system over the last fourteen years. And if I'm China, I'd be like, uh, "Hang on a sec." I'd like to inspect your 8,100 tons, right? right? I mean, when we've we've seen we've seen the U.S. deny that inspection because remember when when Germany repatriated or requested to repatriate their gold, they originally asked for, I think, and I don't know the exact number, so don't hold me to it, but it was plus or minus 700 tons, and the U.S. kind of ignored it at first, and then they finally agreed to 300 tons, right? And it and it was they said, well, we'll do it over seven years. And they said they, you know, well, they, they got back it back over seven years. They got it done in like three or four years, but most of the gold sent back to Germany wasn't the original gold that was brought over here after World War II. Now, what led to that, what led to that repatriation is that a is that Germany requested the right to send a delegation over here to go into the vaults. Okay, because the Fed has several vaults, right? Some of it's in this so-called underground storage at West Point. They requested, and, and the Fed and, and the Fed said, "Well, we have your gold spread across nine vaults. Well, we can only let you in one." And Germany said, "No thanks." And then, you know, fast forward, however many months later, they said, "Okay, we just want we want part of our gold back. We want to repatriate it, right?" So. so Germany had already requested just to inspect the gold that they had title to in the Fed's vaults, and the U.S. government said no. Nine. <laughs> Sprechen Sie Deutsch? Nine. <laughs> so we've already seen that that denial happen. Now imagine if 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 the the SCO uh, brick block goes to a gold standard currency system, and the U.S. you know requests to join in. Because if I'm China, I'd be like, okay, well, we've got a gold back currency and we're happy to trade with you, but we don't want your paper money. We want a gold back currency to use for trade. And the, that's, that's when the U.S. says, well, we got gold. And then China says, well, let's, can we see it? What happens then? Well, that is something I've thought about where even if the U.S. went to a gold standard, you know, it's like, what what would it take for for people to trust whatever they say? All right, this dollar's backed by this much gold. What would it take to trust that they actually have that there? Now, on an international level, I could see it being more easier to verify. Where basically, if you're sending the paper, you send the gold with it. Um, although, perhaps last question for today. We've seen China accumulating gold. I mean, Jesus. I mean, years of you and I've been talking about this. It's not five or ten, ten years that China's been doing it. I mean, it's been going on for a while. They have not called me to tell me their ultimate plan or motivation behind this. But <laughs> what what do you think there is at the heart of it that is going to be a move to a gold back currency, whether digital uh, currency? But do you, do you think that's what they are actually headed to at some point? I mean, you don't have a bat phone that goes directly to Xi Jinping, you know, to to bounce ideas off him or to let him call you and pick your brain. <laughs> he has not answered lately. I, I hear they have things locked down quite a bit there right now. So. 
He was actually going to be today's guest on the show, but he called out. So I appreciate you filling in. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, what, what do you, what would you imagine is their ultimate plan to actually do with it? Yeah, I think that's what their ultimate plan is. I mean, I, once I jumped into this sector, you know, with full force back in 2001 and just read everything I could. Um, some of it was, you know, I, even I would call it conspiracy theory and some of it, well, most of it was, you know, good information. And there's guys that were writing back then that are that are you know you see the stackers today and you think they're hardcore metal bugs. You know these guys. You know a lot of these guys have disappeared. They've just basically gone off the off the grid. Eric DeCarbono. Some people out there may recognize that name. I, I don't know if he. I think occasionally he may put an article in the public forum, but he's he's kind of disappeared. Um, and he was he was one of the real like hardcore metal bugs. Um, but, you know, even back then, you could see what China was doing. And Alistair McLeod has, um, I think he's traced back the roots of China's, the start of China's massive accumulation to like, I think the 1980s. I think he said they've been, based on the research he's he's done, you know, they've been, they've been doing this for a lot longer than just the year 2000. So, um, you know, I, again, and it's... I had a very wise person remind me of this, you know, 17 years ago. When you have when you have changes to the monetary system over the course of history, they take a long time to happen. I mean, think about how long it took for Rome to fall. But you know, when you read through the history of Rome, you could see that it was collapsing, you know, probably just after and maybe in 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 coincidence with when when Caesar became the emperor, right? When when he was the El Jefe, so and that took a long time, like you know, to really completely collapse after that. Well, you could argue that we've been, you know, the collapse in this country started at least as far back as when the Fed was erected back in 1913, right? But there's actually an article, and I think I still have it. I may have it saved somewhere where the guy traces back the actual beginning of the severance of the gold standard to the Lincoln administration, because it was then that um, it, there was a whole involved court case about this. But I guess it was I think it was some woman had war bonds, you know, because the government was issuing civil war bonds. And she decided to use that as legal tender to settle a debt. And I don't know if it was a, you know, some type of goods and services transaction or whatever, but, and the guy wasn't going to take it. So she filed a lawsuit and eventually it wound its way into the Supreme Court when, when Ulysses Grant was the president, but Lincoln approved that transaction. And then it was, there was the legal battle that ensued. Um, and the Supreme Court deemed that it was okay to use government treasuries or government debt as legal tender. And that's why government debt is now used today as collateral. And that's why you have this massive web of Ponzi collateral out there globally that's going to take down the banks again eventually. So um, I guess my point here is and you, if you wanted to say, OK, the beginning of the beginnings of the of the collapse of the current dollar based fiat system really trace back to before the Fed was was erected. But certainly once the Fed was erected. We, you know, we grew further and further apart from a gold-backed currency, right? And it's interesting because, and I haven't done this exercise for a long time, but you can, you can um, trace back and the Dow gold ratio, you know, hundreds of years. There's charts on the internet that let you do that, and you can see that the Dow gold ratio started to gently start to rise in the late 1800s. So, um, you know, and to me, that was your sign that that the that the U.S. dollar was losing its was slowly losing its gold backing. So, um, you know, China's had this plan in place for 20 or 30 years in, in terms of a historical scale. That's 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 a pretty short period of time. But I do think this whole thing could be coming to a head. And again, I would urge people who haven't seen, you know, the end of that podcast, and you might want to put the link in the 
YouTube video to the podcast. Um, and just fast forward to where Andy, you know, it's, it's I think it's like within the last 10 minutes of it. Um, cause I went back and re-listened to it. Cause I mean, he, to me, he just, he lays it out perfectly. What's, what's going to unfold here. And I think it's going to unfold within the, the next five years, you know, and I'm not, you know, it could happen next year. Um, it could happen the year after, but I think it's something that's going to unfold within the next five years that we'll have some type of monetary reset that will involve um, backing the currency, whatever form the currency takes, right? Whether it's digital or whether it's we still have paper currency, um, but your, your, your currency that your central bank issues has to be backed by um, either some sort of basket of gold and silver and whatever else, or, you know, just gold and silver. And maybe just gold, I don't know. Well, of course, we've we've heard reports of Russian officials talking about that. And I, I know some people wonder, well, we didn't see them do it. They haven't made any further announcements. At least from what we've seen from Putin in the last couple of years, it doesn't seem as if they say a lot of things that they don't intend on doing. And it seems like they're studying a lot of these things. So we'll will be an interesting piece of history to watch it all unfold and David Well just as Andy was saying I mean you know China was beta testing their digital currency at the Olympics Yeah there's there's a bunch of them uh, even the Fed's doing their pilot program now wouldn't that be right. the Fed now they were going to put some gold behind that although I won't hold my breath on that one but going to be an eventful couple of years. So Dave, I appreciate everything that you shared with the audience here today. And it's good to have you back on the show. And perhaps just before we wrap up, you could let people know where they can find you and also the mm -hmm. mining stock and short sellers journals that you write. Sure. Well, you can find them all in the same place, investmentresearchdynamics.com. So um, there it is. And the links there, just, you know, have a description of what's involved with each newsletter. There's, there's no, you know, there's a one month minimum and that's, that's it. Other than that, no time requirement. Well, I appreciate what you do there. Obviously digging into the mining stocks, which certainly in a gold and silver rally have the potential to do quite well. And also covering some of this economic mess the Fed has left us with and certainly some detailed research, especially on the real estate market. So Appreciate all that you're doing. And thanks again for making some time to talk about these markets today and look forward to seeing you again in two weeks, my friend. Well, thanks for making time to join me on my bi-weekly podcast oh, for Arcadia you. Economics. Honored, honored <laughs> to be the guest here today. So we'll, we'll, we'll see you again in two weeks, buddy. That sounds good. Well, thank you again to Dave Kranzler for joining me on the show. It was a fun conversation. Hopefully you enjoyed that one at home and Gave you at least a few things to think about as we watch and see how these events unfold and progress, certainly shaping up to be an interesting year in 2023, and look forward to covering that going forward with you. Real quick before we wrap up, would like to thank Raina Silver, who brought us today's video, and Raina, as you may know, exploring three high-grade district-scale assets, two in Mexico, one in Nevada, and... The two in Mexico, which includes Gigi, their flagship asset, located in the Santa Lulia Mining District, which historically produced over 500 million ounces of silver, was half of one of the largest carbonate replacement deposits. They're looking for the other half. Phase one and two drilling has been completed. And out of nearly 1,500 samples, over 10% reported gold grades of 1.1 to 32.6 grams per ton gold and 6% reported silver grades between 199 and 14,170 grams per ton gold. They also have their Batopilas project in another historically high-grade silver district, high-grade samples from 305 to as high as 42,000 grams per ton silver, and they've also discovered gold mineralization in the northeast region of their project there. And lastly, as Lauren McGaw, who was on the show recently to talk about their Medicine Springs drilling program, which is just underway. They've done a Jasperoid sampling program, which has revealed carbonate replacement deposit zonation, including silver, lead, zinc, and copper. And they've also found high-grade silver samples there. 
We'll find out more about the results from that drilling program in the next couple of months. But certainly if you're looking for exposure to projects that have the potential to be high grade district scale assets, well, you can find out more about Raina Silver at RainaSilver.com and appreciate them sponsoring tonight's episode and bringing you today's show. And to find out a little bit more about what Lauren McGaw had to say about it, well, you can just click on the video that's coming your way now. <laughs> <laughs>